Hey there, it was, uh, it was an absolute great session this morning and, and to love the testimony, the power in the testimony and, and uh, very much like I said I think last night, the Holy Spirit wants to walk us through stuff. I think with Israel, he only walked them around once Sinai and the rest of it was all through. And, uh, but look, let's pray and we'll get straight into it. I've got something for us this morning. I was actually going to change the message. And, uh, and thinking, Holy Spirit, you want me to change it? And actually, Liana, you gave me a cue into it. And uh, so I'm excited. You excited? Yeah. Do you love the Lord? Yeah. Hey, look, there's more. Yeah. Okay, we just can't stay here. Yeah. We've got to keep building. All right? And uh, we're construction workers. Um, he will build the church. The church belongs to Jesus. And uh, that's what he's doing. It's a construction work. And it's my church. He calls it his church. So he loves the church. Absolutely loves the church. Got a passion for his people. It's what he's building on this world today. If you don't want to know what Jesus is doing, he's building his people, edifying, encouraging up into the full measure and stature of Jesus. And, uh, but I actually did think this morning, um, Don, there might be people that actually are not saved. And uh, <laughs> so here we go. Um, I'm going to do an altar call for salvation right here and right now. I'll tell you the reason why, because Jesus said, I'm the way. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Interesting, he, he is the way. He is truth. He is life. Those things the whole world needs is a way. It needs to live in truth, and it needs to have a life. It's found in Christ. The Bible says in the book of Romans that all things are summed up in Jesus. There's never, it talks about for this one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It says, neither is there salvation given amongst any other name except the name of Jesus Christ. And so what it is, is this, you can be like I was at the age of 18 years of age up to, I grew up in the church, I knew about God, I set up the back and, uh, you know, God had still answered my prayers. I would still cry when they sang some of the songs. But I was full of bondage. I was full of rebellion. I was full of sin and rejection and insecurity. And everything you can imagine in their violent temper and so forth, I was living separated, unplugged from God. I'd never really crossed the line. I had prayed prayers. I had people pray over me. I had gone to uh, different uh, ministries, or different campus life things, or youth ministries. It was exciting stuff. and enjoyed it. But I never really fully had crossed the line. And it showed because during the times of praise and worship, there was, no, there was nothing there. It was like there was a dead space between me and God. We try and say, well, that's an absence of the Holy Ghost, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, that's not being born again. When you're born again, you, there's a something within you that wants to yeah. worship God. There's something within you that wants to uh, read the Bible. There's something within you that wants Christian fellowship more than secular fellowship. There's something within you that wants to pray. There's a, there's a yearning, there's a desire, and that sits even outside of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that puts the fire into your soul. That's a different realm. That's a different message. But we're talking about being born of the Spirit of God. And I was thinking last night, I was, I was hitting the hay or going to bed in that. What it is, is when we begin to unplug from God, we disconnect from God, we disconnect from the source of life the Zoe life of God, the God life, and we become religious. Now, let me tell you this. There are old people sitting in churches completely religious today. <clears throat> Ghosts of their former selves. But there are also 13 and 12-year-olds sitting in the church today that are also as equally religious. It has nothing to do with age or gender. It's a state of where you're at. And here's the bottom line is this. You've got a gap in your life. Only Jesus Christ can fill it. You can't fill it with sex. You'll never fill it with illicit relationships. You can't fill it with alcohol or pornography. You won't even be able to fill it with anything else. That'd be like going to the garage, remember, and uh, saying, look, I need to fill the vehicle up, my truck up. It should take oil. It should take uh, a diesel, but I'd like you to put Coca-Cola in it, please. And the attendants will say, you've got to be mad and out of your mind. Well, that's how we live our life. We try to fill it with substances and replacements and anything but Jesus Christ. And so you'll be surprised this is that if you're not in Jesus completely 
and haven't crossed the line, that there's something within you that will be on the opposite side. You're not in the kingdom of God. You are actually resisting God. You actually resist Him just by virtue of that position. So what I want us to do, I want us to think this way. Figure and consider this way. And I said to the hairdresser the other day, and I said, I said his name is Rangi. I said, I said, Rangi, I said, think about this. If this afternoon you got in a coma, rushed to hospital, and things began to get bad, family members are called up from New Zealand, you had about four or five days, they were counting down the clock, and you passed away. Five seconds after you die, you're going to know more about God than most of us. It's called a lost eternity. Do you know where you would go? Are you sure of it? Because if you're not sure, then you don't know maybe. And if you don't know, maybe you haven't crossed the line. Because when you cross the line, you have to give everything all over. It's not like, well, I'll give him my career, but I'll hold on to my sex life. Or I'll hold on to my sex life, but don't you touch my education. We would never say that to God, but that's how we live. And so if you haven't crossed the line and you're not sure right now, I want to tell you, I love you to bits, but it's a message. It's a true message. It's critically important that everybody, especially in this generation coming through, is born of the Spirit of God. It's going to be the most important decision, not for you to live a blessed life, please. That comes with the territory. No, it's for your eternal state. Amen? Amen. If you're not sure right now, I want every eye closed, if you would, and just bless you. If you're not sure, you don't know. You haven't really crossed that line. Maybe you're on the fringes. You might have been brought up in the church. Dad and mum might be elders, pastors. If you're not sure, I'm going to invite you to lift up your hand in just a moment. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for salvations right now all over the auditorium. Father God, now is the time in Jesus' name. I got a dream a few months ago and the Lord spoke to me and said, zero time for the harvest. He said, I'm giving zero time for the harvest. This is the time is now. The miracles are now. Healing's now. Salvation's are now. But salvation is right here now. God is here. He's got angelic force, an army around this meeting right now. In Jesus Christ, I'm harvesting souls. Friend, if you're not sure right now, you don't know. You're not so sure. I want you to slip up your hand right now in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. If you're not so sure right now, in Jesus' name, if you're not sure where you would go, don't play a game. Please lift up your hand right now. Good on you. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you. God bless you. All over there. I want you quickly. I want everybody to stand to their feet right now, in Jesus' name. If you lifted up your hand and I saw you in Jesus' name, it's a holy moment. I want you to rush out of your feet really quickly and come to the front. Just get out. People will make room for you. Just come quickly. If you're not sure, just come in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. There's more of you up the back there. God bless you. If you're not sure, there's some out there. I know that. I know that in Jesus' name. If your heart is ticking away right now, if your heart is ticking away and you're not sure in Jesus' name, come out in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you. There's one young man. I know who you are. You're not born of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, you need to respond in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, welcome, family. What I want us to do, we'll all say the prayer, and um, we're going to introduce you fully to Jesus in Jesus' name. This is just the beginnings of your flight, <laughs> of your destiny with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Maybe repeat after me, and we'll all do it. Father God, Father God I, thank you I thank you for your grace, for your grace. and your mercy. Your mercy. In, Jesus name I come. in Jesus' name I come. I ask, I ask that you would forgive me you for walking in independence, and for doing my own thing. I ask that you would forgive me for all of my sin, my arrogance, my bitterness, my offenses, in Jesus' name. And right now, you'll be th things will be coming to your heart and coming to your mind. And in Jesus' name, I accept your forgiveness. I accept your cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I thank you 
that I have crossed the line into eternity right now. I thank you for eternal assurance. And I renounce all allegiance to the spirit of this age and every satanic enterprise power. In Jesus Christ's name, I welcome you into my life as absolute Savior, King and Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. Now, what I want to do is, Father God, we just ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would touch lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Destiny is on them, you son. I tell you what, God is calling you to be an evangelist. He's calling you to be a powerful leader in this army. And I'm talking to you, son, in Jesus Christ's name. Thank you, Father God. I want everybody to come out and give these guys a real quick hug. Out of your seats, just welcome them into the family. Just come where you are, just give them a hug. Sister, you need a hug right now. God bless you. You need a hug, sister. Thank you, Lord. Don't be shy. Just come and give them a hug right now. These are part of your youth ministry. Thank you, Lord. Awesome stuff, man. God is giving you assurance. God bless you, son. In Jesus' name. Awesome. Awesome, mate. I'll tell you what. It, he's on you. Good on you, sister. Thank you, Lord. I've got their tissues here. Got their box here. Ah. All right, you may be seated. Hey, bless you, mate. How are you? Hey, can you give me a hand here? Yep. And uh, can you help me with this here down here? You guys are strong enough to do that. That's for sure. Hey, that's awesome. Let's give the Lord a hand today. Thank you. Um, why do you have to have your pulpit so heavy? <laughs> exactly. It's the glory. Yeah. No, 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 back, back. <laughs> this way. <laughs> That's fine. Mate, like some big rock group or something. All these rock artists have got saved, so this have to be heavy metal. Hey, um, hey, bless you. That's fantastic. I uh, really love Julia, the session today. It's, you got a powerful testimony. Um, you know, Don and Julie, it's very, very powerful. And uh, it is actually, unfortunately, in ministry, it's some of the things that do happen to people. But um, God takes us through these things, does a work inside us. Or, so he does a work in through us. Hey, I want to talk today, I'm actually going to talk about the power of sin. Can you handle a little bit of teaching this morning? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you why, because I'm going to try and instruct us in the Word of God and try and go systematically through some things and uh, help us to get out the other side. And, uh, and so uh, I'm going to I've talk the message. If you, if you gave it a title in your notes, God bless you if you've taken them. And uh, it's from darkness and into the power of light, or darkness into light. I'm going to talk about confession. I'm going to actually begin to talk about, in Jesus' name, areas that we've got that are latent, that are hidden, that are concealed in our life that we don't tell anybody about, and how the enemy targets that. The Bible says we should not give the devil a foothold, and that means a position to operate from. Okay, so what he does, remember when Jesus said this, he said, Satan comes and has nothing in me. But unfortunately, you will find for us, it's those very little 10% and 20% secrecy life. The seed of secrecy is the seed of separation. You will find it's those dark areas that the enemy raids constantly that brings judgment, condemnation, and shame over our life, and we never fully get a breakthrough. It's one of the key areas that God wants. He wants lordship. So that means it's every aspect, every area, every dimension of our heart. Our heart is like a container. The Bible says this, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. And so you'll find that our heart contains, it contains bitterness. It contains offense. It contains pride. It contains jealousy, comparisons, insecurities. It contains perversions. All these kinds of things, that's where, and did you know the interesting thing about the heart, guess who else wants to flow through the heart? The Holy Spirit, because out of our heart flows rivers of living water. So in other words, one of the reasons why I've got people in church that look like stunned mullets, that absolutely dead in their souls and that sort of stuff, is because they've allowed bondage around their lives and they haven't got liberty in Jesus' name. 
there are judgments for some of us. We're under judgments. And when we, we begin to live like this, we begin to live a condemned life that we feel inadequate. Don talked about that before a little bit where we, you know, we feel inadequate or we feel like unworthy. But it's the one of the reasons is because if we allow sin to have dominion over us or lordship or authority over our soul, it actually brings us into low level Christian living. Now, I want to say this, is that the word elevation is very, very important because when it comes to elevation, God wants to bring us up into high places. Remember, uh, David said, you know, he brings my feet up into high places. Remember, lift up your heads. Remember this? Uh, lift up your heads, O ye gates, because you're a gate. You've got to lift that head up. You're, a, you're like a channel or a, a shaft of light where God begins to come through um, and so forth and uh, lift it up. But you're in, interesting in Scripture because Jesus went up to the hills. He went into the wilderness. He went into the mountains to pray. Song of Solomon said about the mountains. What does he say? The mountains are where the spices are and where the fragrances. So in other words, when you get up, that's where the glory is. What did the Lord say? He said uh, in Revelation, he said, the door was open to me in the spirit. And he said, up I went. It was an invitation to come up. How come Moses went up to the holy mountain? We see Elijah in the spirit coming up to Mount Carmel. There's something. It's all pictures. It's all types and analogies about you living up. And what sin does, it brings oppression. Solomon put it this way. He said, when, he said this. He said, uh, um, oppression brings or robs a wise man's reason. In other words, we begin to lose the sanity of our mind when there's sin around us. And what sin does, sin brings oppression. You know, I look at our country and that, and I said to our men, in particular in our men's meetings, you've got 50-year-olds and 60-year-olds that look 70 and 80 years of age. Yeah. They've got lost the life out of them. They're half, this, they're half the men. And it's not because they've have got big mortgages. It's because the Bible talks about sexual morality and the book of Proverbs, what it does. It actually robs our flesh and destroys and wounds our soul. And you've got men that have been in adultery and illicit relationships without repentance and confession and restoration. And what's happened, they actually walk in around, but they're dead in their souls. Seriously, you've got to see that. They're completely dead. There's women that look way older than what they are because they've never been set free. But here's the exciting stuff. You remain, no, you don't quite remain, but you look young in the spirit. When you're in the Holy Ghost, he keeps you fresh. He keeps you stable. He keeps you able. What does the enemy try to do? He tries to seduce you because he wants to reduce you. It's exactly what he wants. He wants to diminish you or finish you. He wants to bring you small. So he begins to nurse and propagate and promote and present to you the stuff that's going on in your life as a justification to keep it there in secrecy. Why? Uh, yeah, okay. So we'll jump into it. Praise the Lord. You excited? Okay. Scripture number one, Isaiah 66 verses two. But on this one, Will I look of him who is poor, not financially poor, but and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my name? Okay, now we're going to jump straight into it. I'm going to uh, go Acts uh, 10 38. Acts 10:38 says this How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and how he went around doing good and healing all of those who are oppressed of the devil. So Jesus Christ wants you and I to have to come up and have dominion, authority over sin, bondage, curses, the demonic, and sickness, pains, infirmities, and so forth. It's categorized into three areas. There's sin, there's the demonic areas, and there's also the Health areas, the sickness and infirmities. So when we talk about the believer's authority, you and I have been called and anointed from the day you got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You were given absolute 100% dominion and authority over all sin and over all the demonic areas, power and dominion over the demonic. And also sin, sicknesses and infirmity. That has to be pushed into the church. We've got to get the sin out of the church. We've got to get the, the pride out and, and everything else and that's there, the bondage, the sexual problems that we've got. And we need to be restored in Jesus Christ, clothed in an Alamite mind. 
We need to be restored in the things of the Spirit to come up. Because when we have these areas, it robs us. And some of our men have been completely robbed. And some of our women, some of our marriages have been completely robbed. You've got a husband that's having a private life, a secret life. And you've got a lady married to him that's having a private life, secret life. And when I say the, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to me once about marriages, the, the seed of the seed of secrecy is the seed of separation. It's like it builds a wedge. But God wants to have transparency. Husbands and wives, He wants to have transparency this way, men and women, and you know, appropriately, but He also wants to have us vertically transparency that way. Okay? So let's jump into it right now. Let's say, let's jump into it. And uh, let's, let's, here we go. John 3 16 and 21. But he who does the truth comes. To the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. Psalms 51 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the inward area or the hidden parts. Okay. Then we come across the famous scripture talks about James, the brother of Jesus, James 5 6, and it says, Therefore, confess your sins one to another. And pray one to another that you may be healed and that you may be restored. That's the AMP. You've probably got the NIV behind me. Therefore, confess your sins one for another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. In other words, this. I, 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 you, you've got to understand this a little bit or we've got to understand. It's so easy to play a religious game. I, I, I'm not joking. And the devil loves it all the time. That's not what God is raising up. He's raising up a church without spot or blemish. A church that's wholly separated under him. That we don't care what the world says. We don't care what our cousin says. We don't care what anybody else says. God wants all and he wants access as Lord to every aspect of your life because he wants to use you powerfully in the nations. The Bible talks about if you overcome the Jezebel spirit, he will thrust you into the nations and use you on that platform. And uh, so anyway, so we're carving through these scriptures right now. And um, why do we not be open with each other? I'll tell you four reasons we've got here. Number one is we feel like if I become transparent and the transparency, I'll define it this way, is the quality of allowing light to pass through so that objects that are hidden can be distinctly seen. Interesting. The quality of being easy to perceive or detect something. In other words, it's not concealed. It's not hidden. We're not in a cave. We've got our eyes, hi, how are you going? But we've got a whole world going on on the inside of us, okay? So uh, 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 Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who covers or conceals or hides his sins will not prosper. Wow. So you're telling me if I was to conceal my sin or hide it away so nobody could see, I wasn't bringing it into the light, that I'm not going to actually prosper. Prosper means for God to bless you as you go. Beloved, I wish you above all things. He'd prosper you and be in good health. As your soul prospers, it means to be blessed as you go. It's the same word there. And so in other words, you're saying that if, if I've got like all this stuff in my life and I'm not really getting it out and I'm walking the game type thing, that I'm actually not going to prosper. That's what Solomon is saying. Okay, then we come on to this thing. What were the four reasons why we're not transparent, open, and confessing? Number one, we don't want to be judged. We don't want people to, what's she going to say about me? It's going to be horrible. What's he going to say about me? What's the parents, if they find out about this, I'm done. So we don't say anything. We are afraid to be ridiculed, marginalized, are rejected. What else? And uh, we fear being vulnerable or being exposed. And uh, or the last one is actually we're comfortable in our sin. We're actually comfortable about this stuff. We don't want to give up the pornography. I've met plenty of people that don't want to give up pornography. 
Because God gives you the grace to repent. Sometimes it's not casting out a demon, it's just good old-fashioned repentance. And so that tells me this. You see, God promises to deliver you from your enemies. He's not promised to deliver you from your friends. So if you make pornography a friend, you haven't positioned yourself for deliverance. It's like pulling teeth. I was sat with three old people yesterday, uh, the, uh, yesterday morning actually, who you part of a, an old movement of God. We had breakfast with them in town and that, and friends of Natasha's father and that. And he, the guy hung out, he actually used to sit with Derek Prince. And uh, yep, uh, Derek Prince, and he said, how long do you take for casting demons out of somebody? I said, well, if 15 minutes goes past and I'm looking at my clock, uh, I get concerned about the lack of repentance if the anointing's there. Because it's like pulling teeth. Because demons, they work on secrecy. They work on a thing called legal ground. So if we haven't repented of it, we haven't come to a place where we actually hate it and walk, want to walk away from it, he begins to think, well, we have access. We have authority. The only authority the enemy has is in his realm, in the dark realm. He has absolutely no authority in the light realm. And that's why the Bible says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them for the shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. So we've got to come into the light as he is in the light. We are light bearers. Hey? Actually, climate changes as well, actually. Atmosphere changes. Uh, Acts 19, 18 and 19. Acts 19, 18 and 19. Here's the story. The revival in Ephesus. They began to preach the gospel. It was amazing. And the power of God began to move through. And then what happened? They, those who practiced magic arts brought all, about $3 million worth of scrolls, occultic scrolls and writings and so forth. They began to bring it through and they began to burn it in the sight of all. And then he says this, that then they begin to confess their deeds. Confessing their deeds. What could their deeds be? Well, let's be creative and imagine it. Well, it could be like this. Well, um, uh, we haven't got pornography because we don't have MTV. We don't have TV, but I've been looking at women in the wrong way. That's a confession. Well, I've been slapping my wife around. That's a confession. I've been stealing. That's a confession. I've been blapped. Uh, uh, blaspheming God, that's a confession. I've got bitterness in my heart and hatred, that's a confession. I've got bitter root judgments or jealousy judgments on somebody else, that's a confession. I've got all this rejection, all this insecurity and all this self-hatred about myself, that is a confession. I've got greed, I've got pride, I've got arrogance, that is a confession. So the Bible says they burnt in the sight of all, in other words, they got their CDs out, they got their uh, junk music away, they got their, their, the literature out, they got the clothing that has, uh, has occultic labeling on it, all this sort of stuff. They burnt it in the sight of all, $3 million worth of stuff, and then what happens? Then the Bible says, then they began to confess their sins. There was a revival in Ephesus. In fact, when Timothy took over the church, they built the church right up to 50,000 people in that time. Amazing. So let's cruise through this. Let's talk quickly about the heart for a minute. The heart. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Uh, who will both bring to light, this is God speaking, the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. The counsels of the heart. And then it says in Proverbs 20 verse 27, searching all the inner depths of the heart. The word depths in the original is chambers. So you're saying, Jonathan, there are chambers in the heart. There are like a house, there are rooms. Yes, there are. In other words, hey, we allow God to go in the kitchen and the formal living area. Ah, but we don't want him to go in the bedroom and you better not go into the hallway or the cupboards. That's kind of how we live our life, a lot of us. Not you guys, because you guys are absolutely perfect, you know. But this is how everybody else does. You're this elite army of people and fine people. N no. <laughs> Sorry. To burst the bubble, not quite. But we're going to get there in just a moment. Okay. And then it says, um, uh, Proverbs 20, 30, talks about the depths of the heart. Literally means, the depths, 
That word now means the belly of the heart. Interesting. Where do the demonics sit? They sit around the belly, but they sit around the human soul. They sit around the heart. Because how we know that is, remember this, uh, uh, Peter with Ananias and Sapphira, the rich folk, <laughs> they held back the, the money. It was, they could have done what they wanted. They just weren't honest and transparent. They lied to the Holy Spirit, not Peter. And the Bible says, Satan has filled your heart. It doesn't say filled his elbow or even filled your mind. He has filled your heart. Did you know the heart actually feeds the mind? It's very difficult to disconnect the mind from the heart. I got attacked in the mind. Yes, you might have got attacked in the mind. The enemy might want external entrance into the mind. But essentially, when you come into agree with it, like Ananias and Sapphira, they went to agreement with each other. We actually, we, we actually agree. We agree in our own heart. And that's when we have to disconnect. You ready? Disconnect. Got that word disconnect, disconnect, disassociate, untangle, and renounce those words, those suggestions, those image, imagination, images, images, those things that are around our heart. We need to renounce the hidden things of shame, the Bible says, and begin to separate them off. So in a deliverance session, I'll say, look, it's important you don't fight me. With all your bitternesses and hurts and rejection. Oh, I sat nicer than that. But with all that, it's important that you're not fighting me. You're fighting with me. You're fighting against that. So it comes a place like Julia was talking about, quoting the word of God. That's such one of the most powerful messages that sits in the body of Christ right now. Is being able to speak the word of God and declare a thing. And we begin to say, no devil, you can't touch me in Jesus' name. I'm God's property. I command you fear to get off me. And then you begin to quote, and we might even talk about that in the other session to come, but we, we, we begin to actually take on the enemy. We're not to be passive believers. We're not to be delinquent believers and sort of be bashed around and smashed around. No, we're to go, we're to jump on the enemy's skull. We're to actually break the dominion of darkness. We're to exercise that authority because remember you're positioned up here. And the position begins to change your condition. You come down into another platform, into this world, and you begin to bring life to the board meeting. You begin to life to your brothers and sisters. You bring the principles and you bring the direction of the Word of God to it. But what the enemy wants to do is bring a thing called shame, embarrassment, awkwardness. So what he does, he begins to prod that. Don't you tell anybody. You're okay now. They don't need to know. And we begin to conceal and hide some of those deeper, dark areas in our life, those things that we're embarrassed about. We're awkward about it. We don't want to tell anybody about it. They don't need to know. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another. It's a principle of humility. And when you, it's all right to confess it this way. But when you confess it that way, you're bringing it into the light. He who is in the light walks in the light. He who is in the truth walks in the light. And you'll be surprised how much the demonic entities begin to break off your mind, break off your heart, break off around your emotions, and we feel absolutely free. And he that's free, we walk in the dominion of that freedom. It makes the difference. I tell you what, it makes an incredible difference. We're just about there. Are you okay? Okay, then what does Solomon say? Oh, he says, guard your heart. Guard it. The word guard... You know what it means? To put a garrison around it. Protective measure around it. You've got to guard it. Girls, you've got to guard your heart. Just because someone's talking to you and he's handsome and tall, guard the heart. Doesn't mean he's going to be your next husband. Guard the heart. When you're listening to music at work and you kind of got, you got Friday and it's awesome, Easter camp coming up, so you allow a bit of moves to come in at work and that sort of stuff, guard your heart. The enemy is there on the block seeking to seduce you every single time. He's a master at seduction. He knows how to pull on our rejection, our fears, our appetites, our egos. He knows how to present somebody all perfectly for you. He knows how to set you up. 
He'll outwit you. He'll outfox you. The only thing you've got going for you is the Word of God and the wisdom of the Spirit through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that makes you 10 steps ahead of the enemy every time. So what does he try to do? He tries to get you in that concealed sin dynamic, that dimension, because there's no power for you there. You're a defeated believer when you're in that space. Seriously now. And so the Lord knows He wants that out. He wants to get you out of that place and into a realm and into a, 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 an authority where you can, what does the Bible says? The righteous are as bold as a lion. Think about that scripture, shed a new light on it. The righteous are as bold as a lion. What does that mean? Because we're no longer shamed. We're no longer condemned. We're no longer living that low life Christian walk. We're walking in the light. We're walking in the boldness and the authority that God has given us. We've got that dominion under our feet. We understand our jurisdiction and the area that God has as our severe of authority. And we can walk with bold confidence in the things of the Spirit because we are more than able to take the land simply because of our position and we're walking it out. This is the way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Praise God. I love Jesus. He loves me. And he's got an absolute passion for you. He loves you so much. We carry the shame like a cloak. Did you know we're supposed to carry glory? Think about it. We're supposed to carry the essence of who he is. We're glorified. The Bible actually says that we've been predestined. And it says we've been called, justified. It means we're free in his presence. And then it also says we're supposed to be glorified. The word means to be elevated. Elevated. There we go again. He wants to lift you up high places. Why does the Islamic community blow the music out, blow their adan, their prayer out, saying that Allah is the way? He is the way for salvation. And they do it seven times or five to seven times a day because it's domination. How about the Bush Khalifa? The Bush Khalifa in, uh, in Dubai. Largest was supposed to, it might be the second largest. And if it's the second largest, they've made a commitment to uh, go head on with China to make the largest again because it's about authority. It's about, they understand something. And so you and I, we've been called where? We've been called on our knees. We've been called up there, position. When we have these areas, we walk in guilt. You shake guys' hands, they can't look you in the eye. They can't embrace you. There's not the freedom. And then you'll get somebody that bounds up and it's more than being a sanguine temperament. They'll come up and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. And And they're kind of like they're not intimidated. They're not shy. Shyness is not humility. It can't be equated for humility. In fact, there's no shyness in the kingdom of God. I'll tell you that right now. There's no depression. There's no insecurity. There's no self-consciousness. And there ain't no shyness. So for you sitting there and thinking, well, I'm just a shy guy, that ain't in the kingdom. For you girls who think, oh, I'm just of the stock and I'm just of the breed of the shy ones, it ain't in the kingdom. So you need to drop it today. He's given you boldness. That's who you are. There's a rawness within you. It's not about being loud or quiet and that sort of thing. It's about what you got on the inside. You got the V8, you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And that makes you something in this world. You are a threat for the kingdom of darkness simply because who resides in you? But when you've got masturbation around, sorry, I thought I'd throw that out. When you've got a little bit of pornography there, you've got a sewer for a mind. Come on. I know pastors that have sewers for minds. Thought I'd throw that out. What is it? It robs you, man. Devil just plays with you every time. It robs you. It robs you of confidence, your self-esteem. You begin to doubt the ministry. It's hard to pray because every time you pray, you feel stinking embarrassed. You're constantly confessing and confessing to yourself and to God and you're not getting the breakthrough, the Spirit of the Lord would say, no, that needs to go broader than that. There's a principle. There's a revelation principle. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. Amen? Oh, just about there, just about there, just about there. Sadly, many of us live with a concealed life. Areas are tucked away. That's where the demons operate. 
through secrecy, the hidden, the covered, the concealed, around the shame, around the humiliation, around those experiences, around the hurt, around the pain, around the, the brokenness. Confession brings it right out into the light. Mm. Um, so there are roots in our life, things like unforgiveness, bitterness, hereditary spirits, things that come down our bloodline. You understand all that. But here's the thing. As we try and knock out uh, addictions, we try and knock out areas of um, the feelings of suicide. Suicide is just a branch. There's a root to that. There's a story. Uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, and LGBTQ+, plus, there's a story behind all of that. There are some roots. Often it's self-hatred. Often it's abuse. Or if it's been in the wrong company, it's a, it's, a, it's a dominant mum, an absence of dads, but there's a story there. It's not the root. But we judge the root as evangelical church and say those gays and there's perversion, perverted people. And it's just like, hey, hold, your, hold yourself back with someone. There's a grace of God. There's a compassion of God that looks at the story that understands but demands repentance also. The other thing is the cigarette smoking. It's just a branch. That's all it is. It's an addiction. It's a branch. Alcoholism, gambling. It's just a branch. Workaholism, I said that. That's all it is. So what God wants to do is get to the invisible root. Get in there. Can I tell my... Yes, you know. Okay, I've just got permission. So that's good. Because I fear my back. <laughs> hey, Bert, we, we, we understand the whipping. No, no, no. <laughs> Honestly, if it wasn't like Julia said this morning, if it wasn't for our wives, they're more than the shiny pieces. I have to tell you that. There's times that we, we get very uncertain about things. Sometimes the, uh, the ego of a man is incredibly frail. It is. And we shouldn't have any egos at all. But the wives are there to begin to sort us out, to speak words of truth and about to help us out. So he has a wife. You have a good thing. Chuck that out. So I, I had uh, areas of uh, sexual bondage in my life. I trigger it back to probably my f mother's line, I think. And uh, mum was in an um, uh, orphanage at the age of five years of age. She tells her story. And uh, everybody else in those days, even if they didn't get along, husband's wife, she was the only buddy in the entire school that had a dad not at home. So she was put in an orphanage and that. And my father, my granddad was in adultery, which is quite unusual in terms of he actually married somebody else while he was married, so he worked that one out. But it was a spirit that came down. So when I was born, uh, I was born with an imagination. You didn't need pornography because when the enemy knows how to present images into your mind. I walked in shame for years and years and years. I got prayer. I got tried to get deliverance. I tried to get help. But there was something within me that was still in agreement with it. I hadn't come to the place of crossing that line of repentance. Even I had confessed it, but I wasn't genuine in my confession. And so I came to a place where I actually believed uh, with areas of masturbation, addiction, and that sort of stuff. You think that's a big deal? You've, you've grown men do that. But you know what it does? It robs manhood. Woman, it, it robs your purity. And so anyway, so what we do is we go a bit more hardcore. So we jump into maybe relationships or, or pornography. And there's different levels of pornography. And, uh, but all of them come from the same spirit and come from the same source. I was born with a spirit of rejection. Yeah, there we go. And so in that rejection, I was wanting warmth. I was wanting, I needed something. Dad was a big smoker. I didn't get into smoking. I got into other areas of addiction that were vile and unclean. And so, so one day, anyway, cutting a long story short, and keeping details out for time, I got myself in a compromising situation before I uh, uh, got engaged to Natasha that I had to talk to her through it and the pastor was involved and he said, but you don't go telling anybody, don't go tell Natasha. He said, don't tell Natasha, you're not engaged, she doesn't need to know. And he said, we don't want gossip going through the church. So I thought, man, hey, thank you, at least I've told my, the pastor I'm all right. You know, man, it's coming up, wow, it's just like that. And then, but the spirit of the Lord began to brood over the next month. The month after that, and I was feeling really awkward. Here's this innocent girl that's kept herself in the things of God. And here I am in living a shameful life, a compromised life as a born again Christian. And I've got the endorsement of a pastor who actually did fall in adultery himself, actually, evidently. I'll throw that out. But, but what happened is this, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to me, 
I want that area exposed. And it was like, no! So anyway, long story short, with the pastor there, uh, I ended up uh, telling Natasha, there was a, there's more to this, and uh, telling Natasha, and she felt like, why weren't you honest? We're going to be married together. Why don't you just tell us? Not to say that it's a light thing by any means. So you've got two things going on there. Number one, you've got this debauched area. And number two, you're a liar. <laughs> Behold, I want truth in the inward parts. The belt of truth. We are truth bearers, light bearers. We've got to live in the light. We've got to live in the truth. We've got no shame. It's not only because of what Jesus has done, but we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So I began to put it right. I put it right with her because that's the right thing to do. And you know what? I had some deliverance. I had had a 12-year bondage. 12 years. 12 years of grabbing help from pastors, being prayed over and all sorts of stuff. But I hadn't came to the place of real repentance and say, God, I'm sick of this. I want to change. In fact, I used to say to myself this. I would crawl on glass on my knees around the world to get free from that. I used to think that because that's how desperate I was to get free. Unfortunately, in the church today, we have a whole lot of people that aren't desperate to get free. But I'm hoping I'm talking to an audience right now of a neat, of a new, brand new spanking generation that's about to hit the forefront of this world that wants to be completely free because you've got nothing to hide, because you're walking in the grace of humility and the power of the Spirit that demands humility and that demands truth in that inward area, the chambers of our heart. So anyway, so I got it right and God completely set me free. In fact, the Bible says on whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I walk in so much liberty. I would get up to the Baptist church. We had old folk there with, you know, real old folk. And then we had the real, real old folk, traditional Baptist church. And the pastor would go, and we had a lot of new youth in that. And the pastor would go, he would say, hey, um, has anybody got a testimony today? Mate, have I got a testimony for you guys? And then, uh, you know, because it's like this, once I was blind and now I see. Remember blind and madness? And once I'm blind, now I'm seen. It's the testimony. So anyway, so he gets out. I go up and I say, yes, I've got a testimony. Thank you. I'll get up the front. I used to have a problem with masturbation. And I used to have, and it's just like all eyes are like this. And I had, a, I had a pastor would come up to me afterwards. And the pastor, one of the elders, got this. You don't know what you've said. I'm so glad you mentioned that word. I'm so glad because there are people that have been suffering and afflicted in our congregations. How we know it is because of our counseling services and our counseling agencies. We know these got problems, but you, my friend, you brought it out in the light. And I thought, well, why didn't you bring it out in the light? In fact, tell your story, maybe. Respectfully. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to do what I would do with my own church. So you don't have to freaking worry. If, <laughs> if you are the own church, we would get you out of the front and here's the microphone. And you would say, I have a problem with, and you would list them. Please don't tell us your story. Well, in 1932, or was it 1933? I can't remember now, and we're all passing out. No, you say this, I've got problems with homosexuality. I've got images of homosexual thoughts that run through the mind. I've got chemistry towards other guys and I'm a guy myself. That sort of thing, okay? Uh, or, or girls or so forth, that sort of thing. I've got problems with stealing. I've got problems with comparisons. I'm immoral. I'm watching the wrong things. It's called pornography. And I've got the lust of the eyes, looking at girls and stuff. I've got absolute comparisons. I've actually got self-hatred. I can't stand to look at myself in the mirror. I hate myself. I hate the way I dress. This thing comes over me and I don't like who I am. 
Why doesn't anybody talk to me? How come I don't fit in? This is the way that I feel. You bring that out into the light, pray for one another, and the power of God comes, I can tell you that, and begins to set lives free. That's what we would do in our church. First up, sister. <laughs> no. I love you, mate. No, seriously, we're not going to do it that way. How we'll do it, though, is this. In a moment, we'll all come up the front. I'll lead you in confession, and we'll all say it together. So in other words, don't worry about what your neighbor's saying, because they're just as afraid as you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Look, we've got, it doesn't, it doesn't, look, please, please. One shot at this life. Yeah, good one. Come on. You're, are you radical? Listen, you're Generation Z and so forth. You're supposed to be doing the off the precipices and doing radical stuff. But when it comes to this, oh, no. No, you're supposed to be radical in Jesus, then radical in that. So what you do, you'll come up the front and I'll lead you in a general prayer. And then we're all going to confess our stuff all together. For example, if I was here, and I'll, hypothetically, I could be saying, yep, I've got rejection, fear, insecurity, uh, pride, arrogance, trying to grab people's attention, trying to dress to please everybody, trying to dress because I want to have him look at me, uh, not praying, not in the things of God, being apathetic, eating too much. All this sort of stuff, because the Bible talks about greed and gluttony and so forth. Uh, you know, lot, temper, anger, violence, rage, wrath. You just bring it out, okay? Is that good? I just gave you a model of it. Honestly, let me tell you this. If you do it, and we're going to pray for you, and if you're sincere about it, the power of confession. Confess your faults. One to another, pray for one another because we'll pray for you and God will heal. I tell you, I have listened to countless testimonies, one after another after another, who said, my life has been transformed. My wife has been transformed, mate. Our marriage has been transformed. We've got people that have never gone back to Egypt. They've never gone back home. They've never walked into those places again. They've walked out of it because they had a heart that says, I disconnect, I disassociate, I no longer agree with that lifestyle, I no longer agree with that sin, I separate myself from it, and I'm coming out from it, I'm touching not that unclean thing, I'm going to be accepted unto the Lord, and we allow Jesus Christ through the power of His Spirit to have access to every region of our heart. Amen? Amen. If you're into this, let's come out the front. God bless you.